everyone. Um, we have one more video left after this one. Um, it's the same format. I'm talking about one of the best films of the year, and my other half is being the best listener ever. There's barely any footage. Like, the footage I show, you're gonna see repeats of throughout the video, so yeah, enjoy. All right, so these next two movies. Oh boy. Okay. I don't know, man. It's gonna get wild up in here. I'm just gonna let you know. <laughs> Oh gosh. Um, okay, so the second best film I saw at the New York Film Festival uh, was this film called Beanpole by this guy named Kantemir Balagov. I completely butchered his name. I'm so sorry. Uh, he's like, he's like, I don't, I don't think he's our age, but he's pretty young. Yeah, he was born in 1991. He's actually pretty funny. He, uh, he came to the screening, and uh, it was his first time in New York ever because he's from russia and this film is russian mm -hmm. and uh he came out and like whenever like filmmakers come out they're usually dressed really nice they have like you know suits or power suits or you know whatever they're like tuxedos etc they're all dressed nice this man comes out in like a t-shirt and sweatpants it was hilarious <laughs> <laughs> i was like oh you're a millennial i love it yes representation or was he wearing jeans he, he was he was pretty casual. I, I, I am going to remember sweatpants in my head, even though that's not the truth. Uh, so this film, Bean Pole, is incredible. It's amazing. And the director said that he made this film because in terms of like the lexicon of World War II movies, there aren't any movies about what the Russian women went through after the war. They're usually about... You know, the people, the men who fought the war and the women who are at home and all that stuff. Like, you know, a lot of the same usual tropes that have been done, whether you're talking about world leaders like Stalin or Hitler or, you know, Churchill or whatever. Like, all those movies have been made many, 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 many times. But there hasn't been a film about the female nurses and the female fighters of Russia from World War II. So this, is, this film is like one of a kind. And you're not going to see any film like it which is cool. It's about this relationship between two women who are dealing with their own trauma, never acted before, completely give, without a doubt, the best performances of the year, period. Like, mm -hmm. period. And they're not going to get nominated, probably, but I just want everyone to know that these are the two best performances of the year. One character's trauma is linked to the war, and the other character's trauma is linked to a, uh, a plot element that happens in the film. So you, so you sort of understand one character's trauma more than the other because the film starts with the main character having an anxiety attack linked to PTSD. And so it's not very clear what's happening, but you're, you feel like something is wrong. And you don't really understand what it's linked to, I don't think, until later in the film. Like, they don't explain it. But at a certain point in the film, it becomes very clear. As you can tell by the elements of the film that I have just described, this is not a lighthearted film at all. This film is so bleak, Zack Snyder could never make a film this dark. <laughs> this film is so bleak and hopeless and relentlessly dour and it's not in a mean-spirited way either it's like so it, it just feels like just the way it is like it's so matter of fact it's so objective in a way in terms of its tone but the way it's shot is not objective at all it's very subjective the whole presentation of the film is subjective the main two colors that are used in the film are green and yellow and it's present throughout the entire movie. The way that they were able to get these two colors to be as much in the film as it is, is honestly impressive to me. Um, whether it's like clothes or uh, the hair on characters, like the main character, she she's blonde and her eyebrows are blonde too. I don't know, do all blonde people have blonde eyebrows? I don't hang around a lot of blonde people. Am I wrong? I think they do blonde people I haven't really I'm going on I'm going on Google blonde people uh no they have brown eyebrows but like her all of her hair on her head is bleached and it looks like she doesn't have eyebrows and it makes her look really weird mm -hmm. the green and yellow is used so well and I was like there I was thinking like there had to have been a purpose to it because like yellow is usually used as like a way to make you feel anxious or in danger 
Like, that's the way yellow has been used a lot in films. And green is, like, this, like, serene, almost complacent, earth-like, calming color. So, like, those two colors clashing together was really strange, but also beautiful and amazing. And I was, it was something I was thinking about the entire time I was watching the film. And then in the Q&A, the director completely confirmed exactly what I was feeling. And he was like, yeah, uh, the green is this uh you know civilian color and the yellow is the ptsd and the anxiety and those th- those two things clashing together is what i wanted because that's what people go through when they come back from war and i was like man you're a genius like you are this young man and you just got it like you understand i cannot wait to see what he comes out with next because he just he gets it like when you watch this film glenn because you better i will even with like blocking like remember when i was complaining about spider-man far from home I'm like, why don't we have blocking? Why do people just stand and talk? What is this? Or or the actors action figures? Like I don't get it. That you don't have to worry about that with this film cuz the the blocking of the actors and the way that they move throughout a room in a scene and the way that a, the camera follows them, it's masterful. It it feels like a director that has been directing for 80 years directing this movie because you'll have characters, you know, they'll be positioned in a certain way in the scene whether they're far apart, whether they hate each other or they're close to each other and they like each other or even if they hate each other and they're close together they're still separated by things in the production design and the framing. It's so apparent and it's so like you can feel it like that that he knows exactly the way that you should be experiencing this scene. Like it feels like everything was thought out with the production designer and the cinematographer and the actors. Like it felt like everyone was firing on all cylinders. Like it, it just how do you how do you improve from this? You're you're almost 30 like you have the rest of your life. Like, what are you doing? Speaking of the camera, the the film is mostly handheld. Mm-hmm. And it adds so much more to the movie because, like, with everything I just described prior to this, you'd assume that there'd be a lot of, like, shots on tripods, very still, uh, or steady cams, and, like, and sweeping dolly shots, very European, very clean. But no, this film, handheld. And it's, and it's amazing handheld. Even the wide shots are handheld. And it's just like, it feels so a part of the way that the movie should be shown to add to the anxiety, to add to the realness, to add to the, to add to everything. It's just the best usage of handheld I've seen in years. Like it's so perfect. There's scenes in the film where the characters are walking through the streets of uh, Leningrad. I think that's where the film takes place. And there's extras just walking around and streetcars going and people having conversations and things just happening. It kind of like blows you away that films are not made like this anymore, Mm -hmm. period. Like even with the films I was just talking about, even with Uncut Gems, like you're watching uh, Adam Sandler walk through the streets of Manhattan and you're like, wow, okay, they just got Adam Sandler to walk in the middle of the street and it's fine it's just adam sandler and you know everyone around him is a real person because they shot it from across three blocks away but with this film every the camera is so close to the actors it's a period film so like that's another element to the film as well and so everything has to be made for a hundred years ago world war ii wasn't a hundred years ago but you know what i mean uh there there's like you can feel the history of everything that happened prior to that moment in the film there's no other way to describe it besides seeing it i don't know how he makes a better film than this it's it's honestly astonishing the just everything in this film it's not a particularly fast-paced film because of the nature of the film i just described it's character driven it's about post-traumatic stress it's about uh trauma it's about relationships between these two women but like even though it's two hours and 10 minutes you were there for every single second of the film because it feels like you're watching something real in a way and i'm so impressed like this film floored me and with that being said please ask me what i went through to see this movie what did you go through to see this movie there was a bigger man sitting next to me breathing so loud (laughs) i think Did you tell us about this? I think you might have. Maybe I might have told you about it, but I didn't tell the people watching this about it. But before the film started, this man sits next to me and I'm like, okay, fine. He obviously might have been sick before coming into the movie. And he had that little squeak that happens sometimes when you breathe and it's like, like that through his nose. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. 
So that happened, which I could live with, you know, if if he wasn't breathing so loudly. Like, he was breathing so loud. Like, he was doing this. <sighs> Through his nose, my dude. Through his nose. How do you even do that? Yeah, that's wild. How do you even do that? It was so... I'm pretty sure the people in front of me and the people behind me and the, I'm pretty sure people down my row could hear him breathing. He was breathing so loud. And and you know what I did? What's that? I closed my right ear. Oh my god. How okay, so if he was talking to a friend or if he was on his phone like I could say something, but how do I tell somebody you're breathing too loud? <laughs> how do I do that? How do I even approach telling somebody you are breathing way too loud and it's distracting. Like, that's almost hilarious. Like, it'd be like, stop breathing, go die. Like, that's almost what I would be implying if I said that, which would honestly make me be able to focus on the movie more, to be honest. It's especially distracting, especially for this film, because there's no score in this film. It's all sound design, and the sound design is fantastic. Um, but there's no music driving you know, making a wall of sound to, like, drown out his large nose. So I really, I couldn't, it was so hard that I just had to close my ear. I couldn't. So to go back real quick before I rate the movie, the lighting in this film is amazing as well. There's there's scenes, they obviously used lights in the film to light the movie, but it, it never, I never watched a scene and I was like, that's a light. Like, I never felt like that. They they really replicated natural light so well, and there are scenes that are lit by candles, and some of those scenes are really high contrast, and there's no fill light or anything like that. And it just, that, that those parts, too, also added to the realness and the immersive quality of the film. Like, I never felt like I was watching a movie, even though that's what you feel like when you're watching movies. You know, you're like, oh, I'm watching a movie. But, yeah. This film, the Beanpole, is a masterpiece. It's, let's see, let me check movies from best to worst. This is my fourth uh, favorite film of the year. Oh wow! Um, uh, it's right under Midsummer. Although I think I might, if I see Beanpole again, and if I see Midsummer again, I might put Beanpole over. But the emotional experience I had watching Midsummer was greater because there wasn't an asshole breathing really loudly next to me. Um, but uh, the other the other two films, uh, one of them I will review in the October video. And uh, the other film we're going to talk about in a second. But uh, I'm giving Beanpole a 9 out of 10. Oh, wow. I might give it a 10, maybe. We'll see. I don't know. Like, I felt like, is there a flaw in this movie? And there really isn't. There's, no, there's not a bad thing I would say that's in this movie. It just... Oh, there's so much care. Like when you see this film, even if you don't love it as much as I do, you cannot deny the craft mm -hmm. that went into this film. Like you, you'll be like, Oh wow. Movies aren't made like this. This is what we're missing out on in America in mainstream cinema. But yeah, this, this film is fantastic. Beanpole is a nine. It could be a 10. I don't know. I, I, I don't give out tens on the first watch just cause I might love it. And then if I watch it again, I'm like, oh, I don't love that. And I bring it down to a nine and I feel dumb for thinking it was a 10 in the first place. If you enjoyed this video, like, comment, subscribe, do all the things. One more New York Film Festival video, October video coming soon, more commentaries, Matrix video. I swear to God, it's happening. Okay, bye-bye.